Welcome to the D6 Family Ministry Podcast, a place where ideas, principles, and personalities come together to give you a ministry advantage that empowers the church and home. I don't know anything more important in our society or in the kingdom of God than to help the church help the family. Discipleship is not an event, it's a way of life. And one day it just hit me that discipleship at home was not about doing more. It was about inviting Christ into what we were already doing. The goal of family ministry is not families sitting on the couch, holding hands and singing Kumbaya. The ultimate goal is families that love God, love people and make disciples of all peoples. So that's why you're here. You're here to say one hour a week, as significant and as awesome as it is, we know that it's not enough and we want to be intentional with every hour. You're listening to the D6 Podcast. Here are your hosts, Marianne Howard, Ron Hunter, and Josh Wooten. All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. I am so excited about today's podcast episode. Um, Not only is this person a dear friend of our family's, but I believe she is a a pioneer and continuing to fly the flag for the importance and the emphasis on what children's worship looks like and what how discipleship plays in to the music aspect and worship and what that looks like in your children's ministry and how that plays into kids' faith journey. You know, um, because I go to some different churches and I realize, you know, kids' ministry and worship Worship in many cases has been almost an afterthought in a lot of cases. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, yeah, we've got to add this, too, because we have to. And and right. the intentionality that Yancey helps to teach children's mm-hmm. leaders about. And I think we've come a long way due to this woman's efforts. And I applaud her yeah. and um, personally receiving the benefit of that in my own ministry and seeing kids' lives changed through those songs is pretty special. Mm-hmm. And also getting kids some some uh, uh, with so many rock stars and pop stars and people vying for their attention. Here is an artist that your girls and your boys can look to and say, oh, wow, she's cool. She's singing about Jesus. She loves him and and leading the way because there's not a lot of people doing that in the kids ministry world. So you go, girl. Yeah. Um, so, uh, one of the things, you know, I just talked about, you know, kids ministry looks a lot different in our churches. I'm just curious, what what does kids ministry worship or worship within kids ministry uh, look like in your you guys' church? Mm-hmm. Lots of energy. Can I just kick a shout out really quick? I love Yancey's fashion. <laughs> Yancey, I love your fashion. And my favorite thing that you own is that collar. And she knows what I'm talking about. Sorry, I just had to throw that out there. She's got very cool clothes and it's shiny and glittery. And it's just only Yancey could pull it off. She could have her own clothing line. Yeah, she, she could. could. <laughs> and and I'm telling you, there are some, there are a couple of pair of pants that I'm like, girl, and it'll freak her out. Cause I'm like, those are free people, aren't they? Cause if I was a girl, I would wear those pants. <laughs> she just laughs at me and shakes her head. Like she calls my style redneck bohemian like uh, part redneck and part hippie you know it's my wow, thing that's <laughs> funny. we bond over style yeah, yeah but, anyway. she's so stylish i you know i think one of the things i love about yancy and just to your question josh is i'm seeing lots of energy in our church our church is very big on yancy she is definitely a pioneering worship in our specific church she comes to our children's camp every single year um and The thing I love about this woman is it's about the heart of God for her. It really is. She is about raising up the next generation. I've read her book. She is really and truly every page is laced and layered and and threaded with worshiping God. And he is central and how to do that. And she's very biblically sound where she's tying biblical doctrine with the words we're singing. And guys, this is generational discipleship and she's doing a great job with that. And I just love that she really isn't about, if you notice, and she's going to talk about this in their interview of like, we've got to be careful not to let the hand motions and all the production things get out in front of us, away from and disconnecting from the heart of God. And so, Nancy, I want to just say to you, thank you so much for recentering all of our ministries on 
thinking about who is who are we worshiping? Yeah. We are we are worshiping Most High God, Most yeah. High God. Thank you for elevating Him and teaching kids how to elevate Most High God. You know, you mentioned generational discipleship. I'll say this, and we'll get into the interview itself. Um, remember, Josh, Jim telling us the story of when he went into what was it, the Ace Hardware, when he was a young teenager and buying his very first guitars from behind the shelf at the end of the uh, model year. And he would pay, I don't know, $15, $18 for that Gibson guitar that's last year's model. And that started his collection and his love of music. I wonder if he thought what God would do with that initial passion that he had for music. Mm -hmm. And here's the key. How many times does a parent have a passion that Satan steps in and takes that down a different road. Mm -hmm. But that intentional discipleship Jim had, his wife had for their kids, have kept their kids so focused on Jesus Christ. And it's very evident through everything you guys have said. Let's listen to this interview and then we'll come back and talk about it. We're joined today by Yancey Weidman Richmond. Yancey is a worship leader, songwriter, and author. Her Dove Award winning music that makes Jesus loud is used around the world, a passionate advocate of raising disciples to worship. She's the author of Sweet Sound, The Power of Discipling Kids in Worship. Yancey and her family live in Nashville, Tennessee. I've gotten to talk with you several years in a row, and yeah. it's a privilege to get to sit with you again this year. Thanks for being here. I'm so happy to be here, sitting across the table from you. Well, in your breakout here, obviously mm-hmm. you're leaning on this book that you've written, uh, Sweet Sound. Yeah. Um, but you also talk about like some common issues that children's ministry leaders face when they're trying to engage their kids in worship. Yeah. What are some of those barriers or struggles that they face? Yeah, well, I, I think probably for most conversations I have with leaders, them describing their, their issue, their problem, their, you know, question mark <laughs> of how do I fix this and make it better? Um, I think it, it usually goes back to one of one or a combination of several things. And that's just what does your music sound like? Who do you have leading it? And what are you teaching your kids about worship? Hmm. And um, I think those three key ingredients, looking at those, analyzing, evaluating, getting the right people in place and being intentional Mm -hmm. and how you're leading them and what you're teaching your kids is the combination to make all things that are broken and not right actually functional and lead kids to worship. Yeah. So how do we teach kids what worship is Mm -hmm. and why it's important? Yeah. Um, Well, the biggie is it's like you've got to do more than just say, now it's time for us to worship which I think is like the common thing that so many people like that's their transition and their segue is just like, all right, let's worship our great God. Mm -hmm. And yes, that's true. But for that person that isn't familiar and doesn't really understand why it matters, it's a little bit of a, okay, you have fun with that. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, sort of moment. And so I think the, the biggest thing that I would challenge church leaders of all age groups that you're working with is just to remember it's a little bit of holding their hand, you know, and just helping to show them things from scripture um, to share, you know, personal revelation, to unpack the message of a song, but just to ultimately break down what, why, where, when, how, some little nugget every single week at some point in your worship set um, to to just give people understanding and kind of give them um, the information. You know, a, a scripture that we're so used to hearing is people perish for a lack of knowledge. And I think that applies to even Christians going to church. There's a, there's a lot that don't understand the purpose and the value of worship in their life, and they're maybe not engaged to that as fully as they should be as a Christ follower just because of lack of information. And so, you know, when I look out there in so many churches, my heart breaks because I'm like, people are perishing for lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. 
they're disengaged and they're not making the most of those moments, those minutes in a service, those songs in a service. And so just practically week by week, planting those seeds week after week after week after week of giving them information of what worship is, why it matters in their life, and how they can join you in that worship set to take part in it. If we have a children's ministry that might have their own service and mm-hmm. and you know worship songs and things of that nature, yeah. does it always reflect that of what we would call big church, right? Like the adult service, or should it differ? And if so, how? Or does one impact another? Well, I mean, I think all the above. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, um, I like. If, if you're doing kids worship in your service, I, th- I think it's it's a mixture. It's like there's the songs that you're going to sing that are just, you know, whatever the it worship song is of that season of life, mm-hmm. you know, um, because it just becomes, you know, that that favorite food, that favorite article of clothing, your favorite blanket you use on your couch. It's that comfort thing of like, oh, I love this so much, you know, and the same thing applies with songs. But I think it's important in our kids' ministry to not just, like, copy exactly the worship of adults because vocabulary matters and being intentional in that. And, you know, there's just certain songs that talk about things that a kid would need a dictionary, Mm -hmm. you know, to look up some of the words that are in them. Not that they can't grasp it and can't understand it, but... um, you know, it being intentional in the songs that you're choosing, the vocabulary in those songs, the length of it, the repetition that's in those songs, all of those things are, are what's going to make for great key ingredients for a song that you should be doing with kids, especially mm-hmm. depending on the age group. Um, and so, but but sometimes it's a blend, you know, and it's you're doing certain songs that are written for kids and are intentional in that vocabulary, in that um the repetition of it, action, all those sort of things, mixed with that worship song that, you know, is not a kid's worship song, but it's just something our our spirit and soul resonates with. And and the cool part about that, too, is in using those types of songs, it becomes a way for families to connect. Because I've had parents before tell, you know, like, comment like, oh, my goodness, I didn't know my three-year-old knew you know, it was back in the day when How Great Is Our God came out. Right. They're like, How Great, you know, because we were just singing the chorus, yeah. you know, and maybe we're not singing all the words and all the different sections of the song, but it became such a cool thing for that mom realizing that her preschool age son knew that same song she did. And so those become moments for discipleship to continue to happen in the car, in those living rooms as those families gather together. And so, certainly be intentional about that. Have you ever seen where a a children's ministry worship uh, experience, Mm -hmm. I guess, has impacted the adults? As in, I think we have all been in a church where there has felt like there's no freedom in worship. Mm -hmm. Like I have to stand a certain way. Mm -hmm. If my hands get above my hips, someone's going to question me maybe, you know, like things of that nature where Maybe the children's ministry leaders have done a great job of expressing that there is freedom in worship. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. have you ever seen that a children's ministry ex- uh, impact like influence? An adult ministry? Yeah. Mm, g- good question. I mean, well, what first came to mind was a conversation I had with a dad who we had a we had like a kids praise team that had a special like rehearsal on Saturday afternoons and. I was running that at the church that I'd been on staff at in Oklahoma, and um, this dad just showed up, you know, early before we were done or something. And so he just kind of sat to the side, like, watching them, you know, finish doing whatever. And I just remember him so clearly coming up to me after that rehearsal and just saying adults could learn a whole lot from watching a group of kids worship. And, you know, and it's like, that wasn't even a service. It was just our rehearsal, you know, prepping, prepping the worship team for what was going to happen that weekend. And, but I, and that conversation has always stood out at me because it's just, yes, it's a case where an adult is seeing. Mm. And, and I think, I think the beauty of it, I know for me, the sweetest sound in the whole wide world is hearing a group of kids sing and it's moving I think always for adults because 
it's it's just pure, mm-hmm. you know, when they do it. It's sweet and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't feel contrived. It's not smoke and mirrors. And it's, I think it's a, it's a glimpse of heaven and a glimpse of what we were created to do when we see that in kids. And I always say, like, kids are closest to the starting line. You yeah. know, they've had less junk and, you know, just the tarnish of sin on their life. And so they're closer to that starting line. And I, and, I don't know, I think maybe that's part of why their worship oftentimes feels just so much more pure Yeah, um, is because of that. So I definitely think, you know, I, I think family worship nights are an amazing thing to do, a, you know, some sort of church-wide thing. And you could go about that a lot of different ways. But I think anytime you have some moments to let generations be there together as well and encourage them actually participate, you know, mm. sometimes generational events happen and Parents are giving kids a free pass to be checked out. Right. But when you're engaging those kids and parents get to be the spectators and just see what's happening and be moved by what is happening, it's a fruitful thing. Certainly. Yeah. Because not everyone serves in, in children's yeah. ministry yeah. or student ministry yeah. and gets to experience that. And right. So for it to be done together, mm-hmm. I'm sure would be powerful. Yeah. We're having a great conversation with Yancey. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Are you concerned about your church's future? Will it serve another generation? The Bible says he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And yet we often only know how to connect to Abraham. Let D6 help you connect with each generation. Your kids and grandkids are counting on you. D6 comes from the principles of Deuteronomy 6 and helps what happens in church also happen at home. Curriculum you can trust. Discipleship that connects. So, Yancey, you have alluded to a couple of different times the intergenerational moments where yeah. we can have a time of worship, maybe, or the fact that you said that mom didn't recognize that their three year old knew this song, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and at D6, obviously, we're about intergenerational yeah. discipleship. Yeah. And uh, we love your dad. He's mm-hmm. awesome. Uh, he's obviously poured into you, both he and your mom. Like, tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about how they have influenced you and yeah. your ministry now or your faith journey. How oh my does that goodness. Play well, I mean, certainly they've influenced all of it yeah. <laughs> for sure. Um, I think when I, you know, over the years I've had people ask me questions trying to figure out, okay, what, what did they do? What's right? the secret you know? sauce? What yeah. did they do right? <laughs> me and my sister were both saying, we love Jesus, you know? <laughs> With a smile on your face. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, certainly. And I, I think when I reflect on it, there's a couple of things stand out. One is just repetition. Um, there were certain things my dad said to me over and over and, you know, had me agree to, like, promise me you'll never, you know, <laughs> fill in the blank. <laughs> And I remember those points of, you know, just kind of going along with it, you know, even a certain stage of life, like, you know, rolling my eyes like this again, like we've been through this 4,000 times, you know. But I also remember some of those moments as a teenager of just kind of like this transition of owning that and, and really you know, going along with it in the moment, but like, I want that for me. And like, that's a character that I want to have. And I want to have, you know, that integrity and just bear good fruit in my life and, you know, whatever thing it was. So I think repetition is so valuable because if they had only said it five times, that wouldn't have been enough. Right. It took the 4,000, you know? (laughs) Right, right. And, and like an example of that too is, um, there's a, an 80s Christian rock song by Mylon Lefebvre and Broken Heart called Love God Hate Sin. And my mom apparently really liked that. And she <laughs> literally wrote to Love God Hate Sin and every single birthday card, every single letter she ever wrote me to camp, it was all signed to Love God Hate Sin. And it's one of those things where it's just, it's impressing, impressing it on my heart, you know, to the point that it became a rule of how I live, love yeah. God, hate sin. So I do the same thing for my boys. <laughs> I love yeah. that. I love it. But again, you see like the generations mm-hmm. impacting one yeah. another. Um, 
I love that. I also love your heart for local church ministry. Mm -hmm. I know how you invest in leaders, how just in the few times that we've gotten to converse, you're talking about, well, I had this conversation with this leader and that's incredible. Like that your influence is getting to touch so many people, even your voice right now, just on Mm -hmm. this podcast, there are parents and church leaders listening. I know that not everyone understands children's ministry. Not mm-hmm. everyone really fully understands worship. So mm-hmm. right now you might have the ear of a senior pastor. Yeah. What can you lean in and tell them right now? What do you think that they might need to hear? Maybe they need to be encouraged. Maybe it needs to be a word that they might not hear from someone else. What can you yeah. say to that senior pastor right now? Well, I, I would want you to grasp and understand the power that is in our worship. I mean, for all of us, but I think specifically scripture highlights as well the power that's in the worship of children. And I find it, um, I find it significant, you know, in the Palm Sunday story that we're all familiar with, Mm -hmm. children are shouting Hosanna, the palm branches are waving, you know, we we talk about it every year. (laughs) And a few verses down, Jesus is in the temple and there's a group of adults asking him questions and questioning what they had seen and heard, which I find comical because it's like, here we are, groups of adults right. are pondering, you know, <laughs> what what is right and, you know, right, yeah. what's true and what matters and yep. all like all these things. And Jesus quoted to them, you know, and, and the little sidebar thing of your Bible, it's going to reference that Jesus is quoting Psalm 8 too, which is my favorite verse about kids worship. <clears throat> but, but, in the New Testament, it says, have you never read from the lips of children, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? And, you know, these, this particular group of adults, they would have been familiar. They would have known what Psalm 8, 1 and 2 says. Mm-hmm. They would have been familiar with it, but Jesus highlighted it. And when I think of the timing of that particular day, when I think about the days that would, you know, unfold ha- Jesus going to the cross and just, you know, what really was our redemption story and our salvation story. And yet Jesus took time to highlight for us that scripture in the Bible in the middle of what, what he our, knew was everything we believe. Yeah. Right. And, you know, in the middle of this story, that's absolutely everything that we have all of our faith, you know, hinged upon. I just find that very significant. And so my deepest heart's desire is that every single church leader, every single pastor, every single worship leader, every single next gen, you know, director, student ministry, children's ministry, all of it. I want them to understand that the discipleship of teaching kids to be the worshipers that God created them to be is, I believe, one of the most significant things um, for us. And I just, I, I believe it matters because I see it in Scripture. And I believe it it mattered for Jesus, and we need to take it more seriously. And and my, my challenge is for churches to start asking the question, what kind of adult worshipers do we want to have in our church? Mm-hmm. You know, let, let's start with the end in mind. So that's where they're going to end up and spend the most of their life. How do we want them to participate on Sundays? What do we wish and hope that worship looked like? You know, how were, what are the things that we wish, you know, people were showing up, entering into our main adult congregation, knowing and understanding about worship and, and just, backtracking, you know, and starting that from the youngest of ages and just being intentional, every age group and class, every stage of ministry, just starting to put into them and develop a heart of worship because it's a hiding place that we have in his presence. And I feel it's one of the best, um, you know, plans as they, as they go through life and are handed all the limits and all the ups and downs, I want to teach people to respond to the Lord in worship just like we see David did. Mm-hmm. And he was he had a heart after God, but I believe it's because he had a reflex in his life to worship. Mm-hmm. And it was a muscle that was built up in his life. And even in some of the darkest, hardest days— he was responding to the Lord in worship, and I want to teach kids how to run to the Father in everything they face. Yeah. 
So the the same side of that question is what about the children's leader? Yeah. Maybe it's a group of volunteers, you mm-hmm. know, maybe it's yeah. the kid's Sunday school teacher, whatever yeah. that looks yeah. like. Let's say you're sitting across from the table from them and they're yeah. they're listening to your voice right now. Yeah. What do you have to say to them today? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's make time to worship, you know, and stop just doing songs and start leading worship. I think oftentimes we're pretty good about checking the box and just doing the couple of songs, but we're not thinking through how we can lead those songs and how we can connect the dots for our kids and how we can you know, even use our songs to set up and prepare their hearts for a message that they're going to hear or use those songs to let them respond, you know, Mm -hmm. after hearing a certain message. And so I think it's the same, you know, similar things of just let's be intentional to disciple our kids in this area week in and week out. Um, But it's, it's also doing it in a way where it's like, we're not, well, an, another thing. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> another thing is for kids ministry specifically, um, I actually was talking with another leader earlier today. See, and she was talking happening. about, I know, she happening. was talking about the book and she was like, I told my girl that's helping with me with this, less motions, more Jesus, hmm. you know, as she went to, to read it. Um, because I think that is, that is a fault that many churches have in their kids' worship area is they have become so focused on motions and choreography that I am convinced we have a lot of kids' ministry people that are worshiping the motions more than they are using that song to actually worship God. Wow, yeah. You know? Yeah. And I, I was consulting with a church once, and they had all these kids on stage participating in a worship team, but yet none of them were singing. They were just doing the dance and doing the motions, you know? And I wrote down, I'm like, are you raising dancers? Are you raising, you know, singers? And and so that that would be a thing, too, that I would just say we need to evaluate, and it, there's a time and place for it, and mm-hmm. there's times it makes a ton of sense, and there's times that it makes that chorus better. But we also, it's a, a, a bit of an illness, I would say, that we have where we put all of our eggs in that basket and put it in every song from start to finish. Right. Because in doing that, we're also alienating certain kids and we're pushing them away and they're rolling their eyes and crossing their arms and deciding they don't want to take part in it. Mm -hmm. And um, I care very much about using the songs and what I'm doing to show kids that Jesus is relevant to their life today. Mm. And so if I'm doing things that push is pushing them away in the process, um, I'm not sending them that message. Yeah. So I love that. Mm -hmm. Yancy, thank you so much for being with us. If you haven't picked up sweet sound, make sure to do that. It's a great resource. Thanks for being a friend at D six and being with us again. Thanks for having me. I sincerely love, um, one of the points that I love that she said midway through was that worship can be an opportunity for families, for discipleship moment for families to worship God. And she just used some specific stories there. And I just really love that. Like, it's a, it's a treasure to me when my boys are walking through something difficult and they come home and they're like, mom, have you heard this new song from dot, dot, dot? And it's a worship song. And it's like, let's all listen to it together. And it's just what a what a great what a great challenge for us to think about, man, we can worship together as families. That's just I loved her insight on that. You know, and, and speaking of families, I just look at her family and, you know, the D6 model, we talk about generational discipleship and just seeing what that has done. And to hear her talk about how Jim and Julie, you know, wrote on the little cards, you know, all the time, love God, hate sin, you know, and as she made that, uh, we were talking about off air, but the repetition leads to impression. You yes. know, you, you when you're pressing down on something, you keep doing it over and over and over. That's why you get, you know, your the holes in your jeans fade quicker. And, you know, if you carry stuff in your pockets that over time, those small little 
impressions over time, uh, you know, doing that repetitively, it changes things. And I think with worship is the same way, you know, I often have to explain kids what worship is. This is, and she does such a great job. This is not just singing songs. This is not just doing hand motions. This is bringing us into the presence of God. This is a vehicle yes. that brings us into the throne room and it's giving them more meaningful worship songs, as she says, that goes beyond routine song singing, which we can so often just slip into that. And But if you create those meaningful, powerful worship set settings, it sets the table for the word unlike anything else. And kids, they're, they're malleable, and it softens them up, and it just gets them ready to, to feed, to hear that. And, and it's such an important aspect to what we do. And, you know, we place a lot of emphasis on it in our main services. Yeah. The same mm -hmm. care and attention to detail and the why behind what we do needs to be placed on that. Because as she said, we, what do we want our adult worshipers to look like? Let's go ahead. They can, they're able to look like that right now if we train them to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She casted just leaders that the end of that interview, I really want to encourage the listeners to really think about that evaluative question that she gave all of us. It's resonating with me. I'm sitting with it. I shared it with my husband because it just was so powerful. And I want to restate it because I really want you to lean into this. I want you to really think about this and evaluate this and pray about this in your congregations and communities. Start asking, what kind of adult worshipers do we want for the future of our church? That is brilliant. Well, and even when she was talking about, you know, the joy, I don't know about you guys, but there is something special about being at a kid's camp where kids are lifting their voices. And when that acoustic guitar <laughs> bows out of whatever song it is and the dynamic goes down and it's those sweet, pure voices. And as she said, you know, they're closer to the starting line. They've not had so much sin tarnishing their life, but goodness gracious, their worship feels so pure and, and, and so un, uh, you know, filtered and, and, and it's just beautiful to me, you know, mm. it's like, it's 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 the good stuff well speaking of uh taking kids into worship and focusing on children's ministry we've got another gifted leader next week dale hudson uh without a doubt um i i think david jones says this in his uh introduction dale has built some of the strongest children's ministry groups and churches across america um uh, he's part of that group that and thousands of kids being in the local church, two or three that he has built through the years. And yet he's an ordinary, very approachable, insightful uh, coach for those of you who will take in and listen. And it doesn't take having thousands of kids to apply what he has to have. You might have five, you might have 500, you might have 5,000, but he will have something for you next week on the D6 podcast. We'll see you then. You've been listening to the D6 Podcast. You can learn more about D6 at d6family.com. 